Good evening, folks, and welcome to the Whitfield Analysis. I am your host, Sam Whitfield, broadcasting live from Next Gen Conservative Studios on the Junior Factor Nation radio network. And I want to thank you so much for joining me tonight. Uh, folks, to be quite honest, it, uh, it feels really weird uh, saying good evening to you guys, I, I know it's 6 p.m., and I, I know that technically we are in the evening, uh, but in case some of you can't notice, those of you who are watching the uh, webcam video, the, the YouTube uh, video podcast version of this, uh, right now, it is perfectly sunny out. And I, I still have the lights on here in the studio just uh, so that when it does get dark, and it will get dark here before the end of the, the program, I just have the studio lights on uh, so that, you know, I still have light when it gets dark. But uh, anyway, that's one thing with daylight savings. Uh, we still start the, we start the show uh, in broad daylight here, so... Um, anyway, that's funny enough. As I said, I'm Sam Whitfield, and I want to thank you all for joining me here tonight. The contact info, as usual, you can email me, sam at calgarnation.com. Just write me a quick little nice email with your comments about the show, anything. I love uh, getting fan mail, and I... Love getting hate mail, too, when I do get hate mail. Because it gives me debating material to debate, you liberals. Um, also, you can follow me on Twitter, at SamW underscore NGC. Hashtag WA Radio Show, if you want your tweets read on the program. Now, as always, we don't get very many tweets, but still, or at least not related to the show. Uh, but still, if you want your tweets read on the program, hashtag WA Radio Show is the hashtag to use. And then, as always, our voicemail line is 941-564-5805. Again, that number is 941-564-5805. And you can call and leave us a voicemail message there and about any topic uh, we talked on the show, and we will play it back on the next show. So if you leave me a, a voicemail tonight, I will play the voicemail um, back on tomorrow's show. If you play, if you leave me a voicemail tomorrow evening, I'll play it back on the next Saturday's show, unless... I'm filling in for someone, which I am filling in for Jason Vealy this week. He is on his way to Myrtle Beach uh, for spring for spring break. Uh, which, which, by the way, uh, I live in Florida. Big spring spring break uh, season here, and spring break in Florida does not last just a week. Uh, it lasts. It, it lasts just over a, a month here. Uh, you know, we we pretty much got the whole entire uh, March set for spring break, and then even like a week into April or so, from what I've heard, uh, we get spring breakers. Again, I haven't I haven't been here for a full year yet, um, but that's just what I've heard. So. Anyway, it'll it'll be very interesting, uh, and I I've certainly seen some uh, I've certainly seen some cute girls around the town here. All right, folks. Uh, so what do we have going on? Um, there are a couple of stories that I want to cover. I know this um. I know this story has kind of come and gone, more or less, but I think it could be be resurfaced. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, that New Jersey teenager that is suing her parents for, I guess, private school tuition money and then for college uh, 
tuition money as well. That story uh, kind of happened earlier this week, and it really, it, it, the lifespan on it wasn't that uh, wasn't really that big in terms of the major news outlets. However, I still think it's worth commenting on. There are a couple of things that I want to say about it that I don't think were really addressed last week or by any of the major news outlets. Um, and then I also want to talk about some stuff with uh, Hair Reed. I guess I guess the FBI is investigating him now or trying to. I got that tip from one of the listeners last night. Uh, and we've got a whole bunch more uh, things coming up in the show. But first, first, ladies and gentlemen, I want to read you a very bizarre story from Truth Reed. From Truth Revolt. And again, this is just, this is weird. Um, this is just weird. I've, I've heard of radical uh, groups freaking out. And in this case, it's the radical LGBT uh, groups. I've heard of people freaking out over certain things, but this is ridiculous. Um, headline from Truth Revolt. Sam Adams quits St. Patrick's Day parade over gay demands. We were hopeful that everyone, regardless of orientation, could participate in the parade. That's the subheadline. Mm-mm. And here's the story, ladies and gentlemen. Because 20 gay veterans adorned with t-shirts and signs referencing their sexual orientation are not allowed to march Sunday in Boston's St. Patrick's Day Parade, Brewer Sam Adams has withdrawn his sponsorship and Mayor Martin Walsh will no longer attend. Parade organizers will allow gay gays to march, but they ask that they do not turn it into an exhibition about sexual orientation, according to Boston.com. Mass Equality, a gay rights group who 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 filed an application for these 20 veterans to be in the parade, said they could not abide by those conditions. Therefore, organizers, along with the with the South Boston Allied War Veterans Council, would not allow the group to march. Since an agreement could not be reached with the two parties, the Associated Press is reporting that Sam Adams has withdrawn its sponsorship of the parade. A statement from the beer company stated, quote, We were hopeful that both sides of the issue would be able to to come to an agreement that would allow everyone, regardless of orientation, to participate in the parade. But given the current state of of the negotiations, we realize this may not be possible. We share these sentiments with Mayor Walsh, Congressman Lynch, and others, and therefore we will not participate in this year's parade. Mayor Walsh also will also not participate in the parade over this issue. However, both the mayor and Sam Adams will support and attend the St. Patrick's Day breakfast prior to the parade. It's worth remembering a quote from Patriot Sam Adams, one of the founding fathers. In regard to religion, mutual toleration in in different professions thereof is what all good and candid minds in all ages have ever practiced, and both by precept and example inculcated on mankind. Huh, so, so, ladies and gentlemen, what we have here is basically. 
mass equality, which is short, is an is the uh, hyphenated version of Massachusetts equality. Basically, mass equality has basically come out and said that um, you know. So basically, the uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade Committee, or whoever heads up the St. Patrick's Day Parade, uh, contacted Mass Equality and said, we're okay with your gay veterans marching, just so long as it doesn't become a homosexual, uh, all about homosexuality. And... Mass Equality said, well, no, we can't do that. That's our purpose in being here. And so, the Massachusetts parade, parade has said, well, fine, you're not welcome then. And I, and I guess Samuel Adams is has also, therefore, withdrawn from the parade because these gay veterans aren't allowed. And folks, the, I mean, this is pretty straightforward. This should be pretty straightforward by now. If you've been listening to this program for a while now, you know me. You know what my opinions on homosexuality are. In case you don't, or in case the liberal left tries to put words in my mouth, as they often like to try to do. My stance on homosexuality is this. I believe it's immoral. However, that that is my personal belief. I, I believe the act of homosexuality is immoral. I believe that there are more homo- homosexuals out there. I have gay friends, I have gay relatives who I love dearly, so please, liberal left, do not turn me into a homophobe. Well, I know you guys already have, but try to curb your homophobic making enthusiasm. Yes. That, that's right, that's what I said. You guys make homophobes. By painting us as homophobes. Do you see how that works there, liberal left? I'm not homophobic. As I said, I have gay relatives. But... And again, folks, this is where my big this is where my big problem with the LGBT community comes in. I could I could honestly give a crap less personally if you were gay. It may be against my moral co- code, and I I pray for you, the um, and all that. But in the long run. If if you're gay, it's 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 just another difference to me. However, what I don't like is when uh, groups like uh, mass equality or the LGBT. Um, or some of the other LGBT radical groups, I hate how they always make everything about homosexuality. They turn everything into a pro-gay spectacle. St. Patrick's Day is about celebrating St. Patrick. And I don't understand why we need to turn that into a homosexual spectacle. And see, that's where my issue with the LGBT radicals comes in. And when they also try to change Facebook and whatnot. This 
this would be this would be like the hell's angels now i know i'm going into like a, a little bit of a different analogy here but bear with me that would be like the hell's angels going to the St. Patrick's Day Parade and wanting to make it all about the Hell's Angels. Obviously, bikers have, have a right to be there as long as they're not doing anything dangerous or stupid. But they're not going to be allowed to make the entire message all about, hey, it's cool to be a biker. And same thing with these LGBT groups. They're allowed at the St. Patrick's Day Parade. But the St. Patrick's Day Parade Committee just doesn't want them turning the parade into a gay spectacle. And I don't see why that's an issue. Sure, represent your group, but don't make... But don't make a parade about the collective, all about one group. Another good analogy I could use for this that would make a lot more sense is when when I was uh, part of the school newspaper, my senior year of high school, we had a club fair during lunch. It wasn't really a parade, but it, it was a fair where all of the different clubs and organizations that were involved with the high school, you know, could go out and we'd have, we'd have booths. And all groups were allowed to participate and represent, you know, the groups. But we couldn't go over the top to make... the lunch about one particular group, we had we had to share and be diverse, you know, in our strategy. Student newspaper couldn't take up, you know, an entire section. We got our, we got our audit sections and whatnot. And that's all I'm saying. It doesn't seem that unfair that these LGBT groups should have to share the spotlight with other people. And I don't get why this is such an issue. But again, this is just them trying to make everything about gay pride. I want to know what you think. Leave your comments in the uh, chat. We've got a whole hour here. We're only 20 minutes into the show. The... Telephone number if you want to call in 941 564 5805. Again, that number is 941 564 5805. You're listening to the Whitfield Analysis on the Junior Factor Nation Radio Network. We'll be right back after these messages.
All right, folks, welcome back to the Whitfield Analysis. So, I have an interesting story here for you. This uh, one happened earlier this week. But uh, I want to cover... I want to cover it right now because, honestly, I don't think that this story has gotten the full coverage. Well, let me put it this way. Just to be a little... I'm not being narcissistic by any means, folks, but let's face it. This show has not been analyzed yet by me, Sam Whitfield, the analyzer. And so therefore, because it hasn't been analyzed by me, it's still a relevant story. There, I said it. Okay. Um, and this one, this this is a story that has gotten some press. Seriously, folks, I do think this is a serious issue. So let's get down to it. Mm -mm, from the Daily Caller. Dot com. Headline, Spoiled Brat, New Jersey Teen Sues Parents Because They Won't Pay Her College Tuition. Now, I know that Zach uh, is in the chat room, and let's see, I, I'm thinking, um, I'm thinking Barbara is probably in, in the chat room here. Um, and also, my good friend Caden Calger joins us in the chat room, too. I want to know all your opinions on this, uh, what you guys think. Anyway, as I said, headline is, Spoiled Brat, New Jersey Teen Sues Parents Because They Won't Pay Her College Tuition. And I'm glad that the, that the Daily Caller came out and called her what she is, a spoiled brat. Mm -mm. So let's start off. Mm -mm. A high school senior at, at Morris Catholic High School in New Jersey's suburban sprawl is suing her parents because, she claims, they threw her out of the house when she turned 18 and have refused to pay for her college education. The plaintiff in this novel lawsuit is Rachel Cannon reports the Daily Record of Parsnippy, New Jersey. She's a cheerleader, a lacrosse player, and an honor student. She wants to major in biomedical engineering. Canning filed her lawsuit in New Jersey family court against her parents, Sean and Elizabeth Cannon. In the lawsuit, Cannon claims that her that her parents cut her off when she turned 18, and that they have been mean to her, to her. She has also claimed abuse. She has also claimed abuse, but there doesn't appear to be any evidence of abuse other than a yelling match, a school official witness between Canning and her, uh, and her mother. In other words, folks, typical teenage stuff. Continuing on. The 18-year-old adult is seeking a is seeking a declaration from a judge preventing her emancipation into the cold, cruel, cruel world under the theory that she must remain a non-emancipated dependent. <laughs> it, are you serious, la ladies and gentlemen? I mean, I've read this story before, but... Honestly, I'll, I'll get to my analysis here in just a sec. Specifically, Canning and her attorney, Tanya Hafe and are asking a New, a New Jersey court to force Canning's parents to pay a, now get this fo folks, 5,306 Morris Catholic High high tuition bill that is currently outstanding. Hyphen will also ask the court to order 
the grown woman's parents to pay for their daughter's living and transportation expenses for the foreseeable future. The attorney also will ask the judge to compel the Canning parents to use an existing college fund previously set up for Canning to pay for at least some of her college education, even though the parents say the fund is freely available for Canning to use for tuition wherever she likes. Finally, Canning's lawsuit as a judge to make her parents pay her legal bills, which is which totals twelve thousand five hundred and ninety seven dollars so far. So can you imagine that, ladies and gentlemen? Not only does this little bitch, and yes, I I said it, folks, she is a bitch. Not only does she want her parents. To give her money for college and whatnot. She wants to sue her parents and then pay for the legal expenses for doing so. That's like if I if I was going to kill someone, and don't worry folks, I'm not going to kill any anyone. But if someone were to kill someone that would be like the murderer forcing the victim to buy the gun or the knife or whatever that they were going to use to kill him. It's just, it's, re, it's, a la, it's laughable and yet it's sad at the same time. But wait, there's more. I'm dumb, I'm dumbfounded. Father Sean Canning told CBS New York, So is my wife and so are my other daughters. The retired police chief has called his daughter, quote, an incredibly rebellious teen. teen. Well, that's putting, putting it nicely, I think. He also said he didn't kick her out at all. Instead, he explains, she up and left on her own in late October because she didn't want to abide by her parents' rules. Aha! Now we're getting somewhere to where I think the truth is actually starting to come out, ladies and gentlemen. An undercurrent in the Family Matter lawsuit also appears to involve the tale as old as time. The daughter's boyfriend. She likes him. Her parents do not. Mm-mm. She's demanding that we pay her bills, but she doesn't want to live at home, and she's saying, I don't want to live under under your rules, Canning told the record. Living in our house, there are very few things, he said, according to CBS New, New York. There, There's minor chores, there's curfew, and when I say curfew, it's usually after 11 o'clock at night. Which, folks, I honestly think that from what I've heard so far about home, doesn't seem too shabby. Uh, But wait, there's even more. Who is fronting the cash for this lawsuit? Okay, next page. Okay. Meanwhile, Rachel Canning is staying in Rockway Township with with a friend's family. That friend's father, attorney John Insig- in Iglesino, Ign- e- yeah, I think that's, it- it's Italian, and-, and folks, I know I'm Italian, but some of these names I can't pronounce, but this is why I need Stephanie Conway here every once in a while, uh, is fronting the cash for the lawsuit and seems to be paying some advisor role in the litigation. The defendants in this case, the parents, have also hired an attorney, Laurie Rush Mershrat. Rush Mershrat claims that her clients never told their daughter to move out, rather that they advised 
her that she is welcome home so long as she abides by their rules under their roof. Rachel decided that she does not want to live within her parents' sphere of influence and voluntarily moved out, essentially emancipating herself. Obviously, she cannot decide she will no longer live within her parents' sphere of influence and simultaneously seek payment for, from them for support. Merch Rat also said the high school senior has been, had been seeing a, a therapist, was supposed to be taking some sort of medication, had been suspended from school twice in the fall semester, ignored curfews, and bullied her younger sister, according to the record. New Jersey law may favor the 18-year-old plaintiff, as the record notes. An important state decision holds a child... A child's admittance and attendance at, at college will overcome the rebuttal presumption that a child may be emancipated at age 18. The next hearing in the case is Tuesday. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's the article. And quite honestly, there's a lot I want to say. And I, I'm reading some of the comments. I read in one of the comments that Zach reads, and I, that Zach put, and I absolutely agree with him. Quote, I'm, I'm reading from Zach's feed. I think the girl's parents should send her a bill for every breath that she breathed in their house after she turned 18. Every bite of food, every moment of lodging, etc., etc. Exactly! Of course they should. And there are a couple of things. I'll, I'll go back to this article. Um, I'll go back to this article here in just a sec. But, but there are a couple of things that I want to bring up first. A. The accusation of abuse... And perhaps this is what got me pissed off the most. The accusation of abuse that this little brat is making really ticks me off. And it's because I know people who who grew up in abusive households. I went to high school with some kids who unfortunately had abusive parents, physically abusive parents, emotionally abusive parents, and had to suffer through actual abuse. And it wasn't just that mommy and daddy wouldn't pay for, uh, you know, private school tuition or college tuition. Some of the, these kids were in legitimate and were legitimately bad situations. And when they went off to college, the last time we, the last time I saw them before we graduated. I, I said, I, I was, I told them I was glad that they were going off. You know, that it was a new chapter for their lives. And, and thank God some of them were able to get out. You know, I, I'm, I thank God for, for that. But, but that really ticks me off, um, number one. The accusation of abuse is not one to be taken lightly. Second of all, Miss Canning, let me clue you in a little bit about that charge. If you are going to charge your parents of abuse, do not do it in family court for God's sakes. That's a matter for the criminal court. You may be a... I may have never made honor roll when I was in high school, 
I may have only graduated with a 2.7, but I am still smart enough to know that an abuse case is not a case for family court, it's a, it's a case for criminal court. Honor student my ass, is what I think. Um, secondly, and again, there there's just so much I want to say. Um, Caden says, it sounds to me like she's a spoiled brat. Yeah, she is. The second thing I want to say, the whole thing with, with the boyfriend. For the love of God... And this isn't just ba based off of her, but this is a common... And again, I realize this thing is as old as time itself. But oftentimes, if you're... Let's assume all things being considered. Her home life at home did not seem to be that good. Did not seem to be that bad. I almost said it didn't seem to be that good. But what I meant to say was it didn't seem that bad. It, it doesn't seem that bad. It actually seems quite good. Her home life... Her home life at some points seemed to, to be better than mine, in fact. You know, just slightly in terms of freedom. And so... the. And the parents seem to be rational people. So given all of that, when your dad says that that he doesn't like your boyfriend, or in my case, that if my parents don't like my girlfriend, there's a pretty good chance that if your parents who are, you know, pretty, you know, decent people... There's a pretty good chance if that if that that if they don't like your boyfriend, you should listen to your dad. And my bet is that the boyfriend is probably a scumbag of some sort. I, I'm just going to put that out there. But no, I want to go and screw off with with my boyfriend and by screw off, I mean literally screw off probably. Um, you know, even though my dad probably no knows better, my boyfriend is more important, even though he probably has girlfriends on the side, and, oh, fo oh folks, I I'm sorry, now we're getting off into my, uh, high school flashback days, oh, lovely, um, anyway, part of this whole monologue I'm doing is parody, to and sarcasm. My favorite instruments. Let's see, what else can I say? Can I just say that... Can I just say that this girl is one I would never date? That too. Oh, oh, and there, there is one other point that I want, that I want to make. So just to prove that I'm not being hypocritical or to any of you liberals, let me explain something to you about myself. So last year, or actually not last year, yeah, last year in 2013, during the summer in August, I moved down here with my mom and my stepdad. We moved down here to Florida. And for the record, let me just state that I am still living with them. I am I am doing so because I am going to go to school next year and neither of the schools that I want neither of the schools that I want to go to have dormitories. So therefore, I'm living at home. Okay, so I'm not mocking her or 
you know, saying that she shouldn't, that she shouldn't not live with her parents. She should. And I have no problem with that. You know, I have no problem if she wants to live with her parents and if they want to pay for her expenses, then I'm fine with that. I know lots of college kids who do live with their parents when they're going to college. I know Jason still lives in his household part-time with his parents oh, on the weekends. Okay? Lots of kids do that when they're in college and even after graduating college. Some, parent, some kids live with, with their parents until they get, you know, stable and can find an apartment or something. I have no problem with that. But for God's sakes, follow the rules that your parents set down. It doesn't seem that hard, hard to do in this. Girls' parents don't seem to be that bad. Okay. And, I, and folks, that, that last point I made is just, it's really important. I, quite honestly, I'm hoping that this thing gets thrown out. You know, the the report from the Daily Caller says that they'll make a decision in April. What's to decide? She has no case. In fact, I think it would, I think it would serve her right to get a, a verbal lashing from the judge. And by the way, I do have, I do have an audio. I do have audio from uh, the court case. This is what the judge said last week regarding the conclusion of the case so far. Cut number one. Go. I think, and I think the judge is spot on with that. I, I honestly, I had to roll my eyes uh, when the lawyer comment brought that up. And if you're watching the webcam, you know, you saw my look of disgust there. Um, honestly, why this thing is still even in, in court is beyond me. We've had some great comments about this topic. Uh, if, if you would like to comment on this topic, leave me a voicemail. The number is 941-564-5805. Again, 941-564-5805. We will be right back after these messages. You're listening to the Whitfield Analysis on the Junior Factor Nation Radio Network. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back to the Whitfield Analysis. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, before we uh, head into the break for hour number two, I, I want to make a quick uh, announcement regarding uh, everyone here. Hopefully, you're enjoying tonight's show. I, I think um, I think after tonight, we will actually be at 90 shows after uh, tonight's program, which is pretty incredible. Uh, we've got 87 episodes on Block Talk Radio, uh, and then, I, as you know, I left Blog Talk, came over to Junior Factor Nation, reset the whole thing all, all over again, and a little... A little over a, a year later, I'm at 90 episodes here. Um, I'd like to take a minute also to announce to you uh, that I am very pleased uh, to have the Whitfield Analysis syndicated on Calgar Nation Radio. Now, this is an internet radio station that uh, Caden Calgar uh, has built. Caden and not just Caden, but Caden and I and a couple other radio hosts have built in our building. And you can find the uh, the broadcast of the show, the rebroadcast of this show on weeknights, at, I believe. Caden, uh, uh, do you have any idea when my show's on? I, I know I'm like. I know I'm like, I know I'm the equivalent of Craig Ferguson or something. I, I'm the late night talk show. I think I come, I think I come on at like, I think I'm on from 1 to 3 a.m. So, uh, anyway, just wanted to mention the fact that the show is syndicated over there. I'm grateful to be over there. We're building a great network over there. And the conservative youth movement is just doing uh, amazing things. Also, breaking news, Jason Veely is, has been spotted on a train to South Carolina. It's a 14-hour train ride to, to Myrtle Beach. So, yeah, 14 hours. So, if Jason's smart, he will do the right thing. He will pull out his iPhone, tune in by a speaker uh, to the Whitfield Analysis until 8 p.m. tonight and be entertained. All right, folks, we will be right back after these messages for hour number two. You're listening to the Junior Factor Nation Radio Network. We'll be right back for the Whitfield Analysis hour number two.
to the second hour of the Whitfield Analysis. I am your host, Sam Whitfield. The uh, contact info, if you want to reach me, as always, the email address is sam at calgrenation.com. You can follow me on Twitter at SamW underscore NGC on, on Twitter, hashtag WA Radio Show. And please leave us a voicemail. The number for that is 941-564-5805. Again, that number is 941-564-5805. And uh, real quick, I, I want to uh, mention that Jason Veely is on spring break this coming week. And uh, he is going to Myrtle Beach. And so on Monday, we have Kyle Winner filling in for him. Yay, I get Kyle two times this week. And then I will be filling in for uh, Jason on Thursday evening. So you'll have me three times next week. And I- I'm excited. All right, folks, um, we've got a lot to cover in this hour, but um, I want to start I want to start this hour off um, uh, with I don't really want to call it a confession because I haven't done anything bad uh, per se. Well, if you're a liberal, it's bad what I've been doing, but if you're just a regular listener to this program, you'll understand why. So, a couple of weeks ago, as you know, uh, March f- March 1st uh, is the anniversary, or March 2nd is the anniversary of uh, Andrew Bre- Breitbart's death. And a few weeks ago, we did our tribute show to Andrew Breitbart. who is possibly one of my, if not the greatest uh, influence in my political commentary career. Um, And I know I talked about that a a lot and what he meant to me a couple weeks ago, so... I, I don't want to rehash the I don't want to rehash that show uh, too much, ladies and gentlemen. But I've a couple weeks ago I also started uh, I downloaded the audiobook. Uh, I had a I had like a free offer to join Audible and get like one of those free audiobooks. So I thought, oh, what the hell? Why not? Um, so I joined and I uh I got Andrew's book Righteous Indignation Excuse Me While I Save the World and I, I got that uh audiobook for free and I, I've bought a couple things off Audible before uh but this one was my freebie. So um so I've been listening slash reading this uh book that Andrew wrote a couple years ago. And he he wrote it like a literally a, a year before he he died. Um, and all I can say is this is a book that I think everyone needs to read. If you want to understand more about this show and what makes me tick, as a conservative, as a journalist, as an activist, as a talk show host. Well, if you want to find out what makes me tick as a talk show host, then listen to Rush and listen to you, to Hugh Hewitt. If you want to know what makes me tick as a conservative uh, overall and as a journalist, read this book. Uh, 
by Andrew Breitbart a lot. I was influenced by Breitbart heavily. So I've been reading this book, and I, I've been pretty impressed. Uh, as I said, Righteous Indignation, excuse me while I save the world as the title. And I am going to be doing a book review of it soon once I finish the uh, book. Maybe I'll stay up late tonight and listen to to it. Um, anyway. Larry O'Connor, Breitbart's old friend, has been kind enough and generous enough to A, follow me on Twitter. Huge, huge honor. Uh, again, thank you for uh, the follow, Mr. O'Connor. Um, Mr. O'Connor is also someone who has influenced me tremendously. Um, and he has friended me on Facebook, too. Uh, which is another extraordinary honor for me. Um, and I found out that Larry O'Connor has, has a YouTube channel. And on that YouTube channel, I, I was looking through it through it last night, and I, and I found an old interview that Dennis Miller had done with Andrew Breitbart, I think a couple of years ago, when the Occupy Wall Street uh, was the big story. And to be quite honest, folks, um, you know, I, I, reading all this stuff that, uh, reading all this stuff that Andrew wrote and uh, all these videos, it just kind of makes me miss him um, a lot. I never got the chance to meet him, but I, I feel as if I knew him, and so, um, somehow. And I feel like I've gotten to know him vicariously through the people who knew him best, who I've gotten to know. Um, and so anyway, this interview that Dennis Miller did with uh, Andrew Breitbart a couple of years ago is absolutely just priceless. And I want to play the whole thing for you just because it's such a spot in, on interview. And I, and I think it would give... It just made me feel feel good to listen to that last night, and I hope it'll make you feel feel good. So anyway, here's uh Andrew Breitbart's interview. Here's Dennis Miller's interview with uh, Andrew Breitbart. I think this is from uh, 2011. Anyway, uh, cut number one. Go.
fearless and quite funny, ladies and gentlemen. I I just uh, I I don't know. I I I had I felt compelled to play that for you because, uh, and honestly, well, this is a topic that I'll cover a little bit later on after the break. But one thing I want to say before I I do head to break is. Lately, I've noticed a lot of conservatives out there have been on this whole uh, doom and gloom uh, track with everything. And folks, I I realize that things are going to hell in a handbasket under the Obama administration. I I do. There is no question in in my mind that we are in uh, very dark times here. But if you can't laugh, if you can't have a sense of humor, if, if you can't have a good time uh, while doing all this, folks, then, you know, what's what's the point, I guess? Uh, you know, I, I come on the show, I cover some very, very serious issues. And yet I'm always laughing, I'm always having a, a good time. The audience, I always try to make sure, is having a, a good time. This podcast gets multiple uh, downloads, views, uh, listens, both on the weekend and during the week, too, because it's such a good show. I mean, I'm not trying to do my own horn, but I've gotten emails from several people saying, you know, gosh, there are so many conservatives out there who are, you know, depressed and who are constantly focused on the negative and whatnot, but you seem to be optimistic and positive still, and folks, uh, I am, I am extremely positive, and, uh, you know, one more thing on this whole thing, I've noticed, uh, and I'm not trying to pick on Christians here, I'm Christian myself, but I've noticed that a lot more, more of, like, the religious, right, as of late has been posting, uh, stuff on Facebook, To the extent that uh, Judgment Day and the end of the world is going to come here either in 2014 or before the Obama administration is over. And folks, I'm sorry, I, I, I refuse to believe anything that comes out of the book of Revelations as absolute truth. In other words, I do believe that there is that there is going to be a judgment day uh, coming here at some point. Probably not in my lifetime. Uh, probably not within the lifetime of the h- human race. I'm I'm thinking. Um, folks, I I'm in my you know I'm I'm 19. I'm you know I had a I'm heading into my 20s, and and we've been, you know, through all these of these Judgment Day, Doomsday scenarios before. Um, you know, I'm I'm I just uh, well, to me, to be quite honest, the whole the whole Judgment Day thing, I I see people posting this stuff, and quite honestly, to me, I I hate to insult some people. But honestly, it's a cop out, ladies and gentlemen. It's a cop out. Um, I find that a lot of these people who are posting this are also using this as an excuse to do, uh, to you know, to to do nothing meaningful with their with their lives or something, and you know. When it comes to, you know, political activism, especially, you know, a lot of these conservatives I'm finding are now saying stuff like, oh, well, we can't become, uh, you know, there's no point in trying to fight Obama because, you know, Judgment Day is coming or, you know, there's no point in me helping, you know, get it in me getting a job or my friends getting a job or, you know, anything else because... The end of the world is coming. I I just don't subscribe. I don't I don't subscribe to that. 
Um, as I said, I, I doubt that the end of the world will ha happen in my lifetime. If it does, uh, if it does, you know, it does. It could happen. Let me put it this way: it, it could happen a mil. It could happen like a million years from now. It could happen. You know, five seconds from now. We just never know. Um, and then, until then, stop talking about it and uh, just live your life. And for God's sakes, laugh a little, ladies and gentlemen. I'm serious. Anyway, uh, you're listening to the Whitfield Analysis on the Junior Factor Nation Radio Network. We'll be right back after these messages. Over the break, uh, Eric in the chat room made a made a really good point. Uh, he said, "Seriously, let's just put it this way: If I had a nickel for every time someone cried rapture and or end of the world, well, then I'd have a crap ton of nickels." Ex exactly, exactly. Oh, wait, wait, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, do you guys all remember the uh, the Mayan calendar, twenty twelve? end of the world doomsday thing yes don't forget that was actually a thing at one point ladies and gentlemen and, and 
uh, quite honestly, it, it was BS. It was complete BS. As I said, um, you know, I, I I believe that the end of the world will come, but I doubt I'll be around to see it. I think the let me put it the, and let me put it this way, uh, two ladies and gentlemen. There are far uh, more catastrophic events that I thought would have led to the end, end of the world. I mean, World War World War Two uh, with the Nazis in power and whatnot. I mean, that whole saga was just doomsday uh, waiting to happen. Uh yeah. Anyway, uh, Bar Barbara, can you hear me? I I know that my sound is a little muffled. I um. I think I was a little too close to the microphone. Yeah. Uh, Eric. Uh. Are are Eric? Are you serious? Is serious, Eric. Eric says that he uh, saw the History Channel, History Channel special on the 2012 End of Days thing. Uh, just just the other day, right? Um, uh, oh, oh, oh. Uh, Eric says I I was the guy who sat back and mocked people, not to their faces, who thought this entire. Th- a thing who thought of this end of the world thing. Now, see, Eric, you are nice to them. I pu- I purposely screwed with these people, like on uh, on purpose. Like when this whole thing was happening, like I got right up in their faces and I, I screwed with some of them. And uh, the the other the other thing about that, and then and then we'll get on. On to like another story. Uh, I I only have one last story in the stack to cover anyway. Um, but back in, but like back in like mid July, when we were, when we were getting ready to move, uh, we were getting rid of old DVDs and old movies that, you know, we weren't watching anymore, hadn't watched and. I don't know how this happened. I think, uh, I think somehow it ended up like, I think somehow like my stepdad got it before he had married my mother or something. Um, but believe it or not, we found a 2012 end of days DVD in our DVD collection that we got rid of. I I kid you not, we found a 2012... We found an actual documentary about how the world was going to end in 2012. And it was made in the year... And we found it in... It was made in the year 2007. And we found it in 2013. So... Uh, yeah, I don't think that rapture happened quite as it was intended, so, anyway. Uh, good God, it, it, it was just, it was bad, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, what else can I say? Alright, um, this is a very interesting headline I ran across over at the Daily Caller. Mm-hmm. Hollywood rallies for low taxes on Hollywood. Now, folks, this is this is extremely fascinating to me before we get into the actual article. This is fascinating to me because the Hollywood elites are always the ones saying that taxes need to be raised on everyone else, and yet we now have them saying that... We need to, like, cut taxes on other people. Yeah. Uh, let's see how that works out. Uh-uh. Anyway. Ho- 
Hollywood has finally realized that taxes hurt businesses and kill jobs. Members of the Hollywood film community and small business owners organized a joint rally on Saturday in Sunland, California in an effort to pressure state lawmakers to give the entertainment industry a tax break. The two the two parties formed a coalition after many f- film production related jobs moved to more business friendly states leaving America's entertainment mecca looking for work. From 2004 to 2011, California has lo- lost tens of thousands of good paying jobs to other states. These job losses and the ripple effect on the California economy could be stopped if AB 1389 is passed. It's time to bring production back to California, said California Democratic Assembly member Raul Bocongra, who is co authoring legislation aimed at creating new incentives for film jobs to stay in California. Bocongra explained in a press release that Hollywood is a vital contributor to California's economy. Quote, The industry creates hundreds of thousands of jobs and billions in economic activity each year. The multiplayer effect when filming takes place here, from caterers to con- to costumes to prop houses, helps to employ tens of thousands of small businesses throughout the state, he said. As the Daily Caller News Foundation reported in February, from 2005 to 2013, California California share of the one-hour TV series market declined from 64% to 28%, resulting in an estimated in the loss of an estimated 8,500 jobs. And in the past 15 years, feature film production in Los Angeles alone has declined almost 60%. While many of the of the once alive and active Hollywood studios have become vacant. Film production. Film production in states with generous tax credits have been booming. Louisiana is just one example of this phenomenon. The year before it enacted its tax credit, 2002, production spending. Spending in Louisiana was only 3.5 million. By 2010, that figure had jumped to 674 million, making for a 19,000 percent increase. Georgia, Texas, and New York, among others, have also lured film production to their cities by establishing expansive tax credits. Recognizing the dramatic impact of California's numerous operating costs have had have had on the in- industry, parties typically associated with encouraging tax increases are now partic- are now petitioning for California to demand the less of the entertainment sector and become more competitive. Warner Brothers, Film Out LA, the city and county of Los Angeles, and the, na- and the National oh, so- Sorry there folks, I had to take a yawn. And the National Labor Representation and the National Labor Union representing working actors are just a few of the traditionally left-wing entities that have formal voiced their support of lowering taxes on filmmakers. 
Many businesses and organizations that are not even directly involved with production have been touched by the decline of the industry. Ray Binost and the principal of Chef Robert Catering also serious concerns about the outflow of capital and jobs. In this slow gro- growth economy, the state of California cannot afford to stand by while literally billions of dollars flow to other regions of the country or overseas, he said in a statement. Bidnost added that lawmakers need to make California more competitive to ensure that the that the movie and TV industry, which is an integral part of, Calif- of the California economy, returns and flourishes here so that we can continue to provide good-paying jobs for thousands of Californians and their families. All right, folks, and that's the article. So it, it's very interesting. Even the liberal left in California even the liberal left in California is saying that we need to cut taxes. So it'll be very interesting to follow and see if the if the lawmakers will follow through. Part of me hopes they do. Part of me hopes they don't. And maybe some of the Hollywood elites will finally wake up to how bad the liberal philosophy on taxation is. Wishful thinking. I, I know, ladies and gentlemen. It's wishful thinking. But hey, a guy... Can only wish, right? Yeah, and and Zach, and Zach, I know they want specific tax. I know they want specific tax tax cuts on them. But as I said, wishful thinking. Hopefully that hopefully the California legislation won't cut taxes on them, and then maybe they'll all be forced to realize what the rest of America is going through. Um, anyway, all right, folks, we, that'll do it for tonight's program. I want to thank you all for tuning in tonight. I'll be back tomorrow night, same time, same place, 6.05 p.m. right here on the Junior Factor Nation Radio Network. Leave us your comments about anything we talked about on tonight's show. The voicemail line, if you want to leave a voicemail, is 941 564 Five eight zero five. Again, that number is nine four one five six four five eight zero five. Folks from all of us here at Junior Factor Nation, have a good night. God bless, and God bless the United States of America. I'll be back tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen. Until then, good night and God bless.